Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my guest is Dr. Ted McAvoy. Uh, he's at the University of Georgia. He's an assistant professor of horticulture. Uh, he's a vegetable extension specialist. So we're going to talk about uh, vegetable production, uh, irrigation, and uh, some alternate crops that may be in the works. So, Ted, thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background briefly, and then, uh, you know, what got you interested in horticulture, and then we'll talk about your, your current work. Well, all my degrees, bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. are in horticulture. I've always specialized in vegetables, whether it was weed control, um, fumigants, or variety trials. I think just prior to coming to University of Georgia, I was a, I did variety trials. I was with Syngenta Vegetable Seeds doing field trials in Florida and Georgia, um, and sometimes even in New Jersey. So all up the East Coast, start out with large seeded vegetables sweet corn and green beans and i went over to solanaceous crops pepper and tomato so so since i've been in georgia i've been trying to focus on variety trials fertilizer management irrigation um cover crops and soil amendments okay well let's start with uh, what, what are variety uh trials what does that mean so with any given crop there's different genetics so you know let's say tomatoes there might be and I'm using the words cultivar and variety interchangeably, but it's variations within the plant that has certain traits and characteristics. So, you know, we're evaluating them for performance, for yield, fruit size, color, shape, sugars, you know, anything, any differences and just general adaptability to our area. Okay. Got it. So, all right. So we know what the varieties are. I don't know what are you working with certain plants to try to optimize again, or minimize the use of pesticides or fumigants, or like, what are some of your, you know, what are some of the particular experiments you're doing and why? No problem. So in Georgia, I've been trying to focus on the major crops, um, which are Vidalia onion, sweet corn, bell pepper, and watermelon. And, and being an extension specialist, which is what I am, I, a majority extension. So I try to do, I try to do trials that growers are having problems with. So I'm trying to find the better performing varieties that, that do well, you know, input costs are a big problem. So some of the soil amendments, um, with sugar litter, for example, are trying to use waste products from, um, the poultry industry that are cheaper than synthetic fertilizers so to, um, see if we could save money and, increase yields or at least maintain yields. Um, so, I, you know, I think some of the biggest issues we're having are labor and disease. Now, we do have other faculty that are pathologists, so they do work more on diseases than I do. But, you know, I, I like being a just a general vegetable specialist. I get to work with, with other faculty and collaborate. And so I've been doing a lot of um, trials with anthracnose management, to see if there's varietal differences and if irrigation management can help with, with disease on watermelons. And 
there's a new precision ag specialist, uh, Luan Oliveira. I've been trying to do machine transplanting and, and machine sprayers, drones, unmanned robotics um, to, to try to figure out if we get to have alternatives to, to the labor dependence. Okay. Um, are you noticing that, I mean, is it, a, is it an arms race? You know, the, uh, the pests and conditions are always changing so that you always have to change strategy or, you know, if you come up with the right uh, mixture of, uh, you know, fumigants or uh, pesticides, et cetera, that things are pretty stable year to year. Like how much variation is there and how hard is it to, you know, continually get a good yield on the crops that are grown? I would say it's arm, it's an arms race and it's probably a battle that's been going on as, as long as time, but, but it's not every day, you know? So, um, Definitely genetics are, would be the number one. If, if you could get a plant that is resistant to a disease, that's usually a stronger method of resistance than chemical resistance and it's longer lasting typically. Chemically, some pests seems like seem for whatever reason that they develop resistance faster and more easily while others seem, it seems not to be an issue historically with, with certain pests. You know, whitefly, for example, they're always mutating and, and becoming resistant diamondback moth um same story uh, well if you have a field of crops are there certain crops that don't seem to be affected by a given pest you know even if like 99 percent of all the other ones are and could you selectively breed the ones if so that are more naturally resistant yes sir and so i'm not a breeder i, I select for the horticultural characteristics so if a breeder gives me material whether it's breeding material or commercially available, we can select to see if it holds up to the diseases in our area, the strains. And yes, absolutely. That's the idea. And, um, you know, we do have a new pepper breeder here at University of Georgia. We have a cucurbit breeder. And, you know, so we're, we're working on breeding and selecting for resistance. Mm. Um, once you have a, a protocol dialed in for a particular, you know, plants or plants, um, how local will that protocol be effective? Like if I have a field in, you know, I don't know, uh, Southern Atlanta, um, will it still work in the same conditions in Macon or the rest of Georgia or like, like how specific and how local, uh, does your protocol have to be to protect certain plants? So it has to be tested everywhere where, where you want to grow and there's no clear answer. So some, some things like you know, maybe the top performing corn obsession or, um, you know, caprice historically, they're very well adapted and they work well across multiple seasons and geographical regions. And that makes a really stable, good variety. But having said that, so, you know, in general, I would say if I'm selecting stuff in Southern Georgia, it's good for Southern Georgia, Alabama, North Florida, but there's a possibility that some things just seem very stable across the board, you know, in different geographic areas. So that's, that's, that's what you really want to see is something that's well adapted, could handle stress, has n not only yield potential, but also, um, yield stability. Are there some crops that, um, you know, again, once you've found a way to protect them, they're pretty stable and other ones need like a different protocol every season. They seem to change a lot along with the, the predators and pests that affect them. Right. So as far as um, vegetable crops, you know, I'd say they're probably less hardy in general than agronomic crops. But, you know, we have got the top performing varieties that are, you know, material chemistries that are, are performing. And also, you know, people know when, I'll say when to hold them and when to fold them. And, and so, um, like watermelon in Georgia, beautiful spring crop. Um, you know, we're starting off cool and dry and, you know, we're, we're, we're going to, um, we're not going to get any disease come until, um, end of May, June, you know, so, so, so for a couple of months, just no insects, no pests. Um, but then in the fall, you can't grow a watermelon crop. You know, we just know it. You're going to have downy mildew from the first one. It's hot from first day. It's hot. It's humid. It's raining all the time. There's a ton of white flies transmitting multiple viruses. So, so I think that's it is just, um, 
you know, we have, we make, that's what we do at the University of Georgia is we make recommendations. We, you know, we trial it, we make recommendation and, um, and I think there you there's stability, you know, that's going to be a common trend. It's predictable of what you're going to encounter. So, you know, with corn, you're going to have corn earworm. Um, you're going to have Southern corn leaf blight, Southern corn leaf blights going to be more severe in the fall than it is in the you know, so I think it's it's seasonal and cyclical and, you know, you might not know it's the day, but within like a three week period, it's almost pretty re- routine in that respect. Yeah. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. So it's very predictable, but the players are adapting and, you know, the old strategies may not work on the same players as before. That's right. And there's, you know, there's certain things you can't control like the weather. And so we have um, chemistries that can control disease, but if it rains for two weeks straight, you can't get out there and spray. It's flooded. Everything's washed off. That's not doing any, it's not doing you any good. And, and you just can't do anything about that, you know, hail, et cetera. So there, I would say there's some certain things that are just outside your control and you can't do anything about it. Oh, what about the, um, the urinal variation of pests? You know, like, so do some come only at night? Do some come in the day? You know, what if you have a field where you can somehow, uh, you know, put a cover over it overnight, you know, a certain bug attacks it at night and, you know, the plants don't need sun then. Maybe you can cover the field and prevent the pests mechanically from coming in, you know, until the morning. Just an example I made up, but right at the case. So like, you know, that's that's something that's ongoing. So one thing is honeybees, for example. So we use a lot of honeybees for pollination and vegetable crops. For things that need to get pollinated, like squash, watermelon, we bring in beehives, whether they're honeybees or bumblebees. And the same insecticides that typically... Um, will kill your pest, will kill your bees. But we can avoid that by timing. So bees typically work in the morning. And if you're spraying at night or in the afternoon, you're not spraying your bees, for example. There's been some some work with ultraviolet light. And, you know, I think just um, having light exposure at night uh, can, can disrupt certain diseases. So I think yeah, there that's that that's um things that people are doing um and even just the wind, you know, if you could spray early in the morning or at night, you don't have um as much wind and and you could reduce your drift possibility. To, to- well, if you um if you spray in the morning and the sun is shining down on the crops all day, um what about the ultraviolet radiation and everything? Would that alter the the compounds that you've sprayed on the plants? maybe create some alternative products that uh, you might not be aware of that would have, you know, good or bad action. Maybe it, it, you know, maybe the sunlight hitting a particular, again, compound that's sensitive that would, would break it apart and therefore it would render it ineffective or more effective or too effective. Is, is there any observation on that happening? Right. So as far as UV light, there's two scenarios I could think of. One is sometimes you can get phytotoxicity or, or, you know, chemical burn. So if you apply copper, for example, if you tank makes a lot of stuff that has the potential to burn, the sunlight exasper- exasperates that, that burning, leaf burn. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other is biologicals. So many times, and there's certain biologicals that are effective, but they're also more finicky. So a lot of times um, people might find a fungus that can infect an insect and kill it. So then they'll try to induce that on purpose where they're spraying the fungus on plant leaves. And 
certain t- that is usually a lot of times is finicky. It might get too hot and that fungus will die. It'll the sun will be too intense and that fungal will die. You know, I'm using fungal. It could be virus, anything. You know, biological. Biologicals, you know, are, typically have a temperature range, a humidity range, sunlight requirements. That if if everything's not right, it won't grow and thrive. Okay. What are some of the new methods that are being experimented with? You know, maybe you're you're doing it or, you know, you see it in the literature. Any new innovations coming that you think will be useful? Yes. You know, I think the most innovative thing I'm doing is I'm working with biochar and poultry litter. And biochar is is charcoal, essentially. And, you know, with this testing it, but um, the idea is that it doesn't decompose in the soil like other Car, uh, forms of carbon so it sequesters carbon and it's a long-term additive instead of having to reapply so cover crops for example break down um, after months composts whereas the biochar they've used that with terra preta soils and amazons with, with native amazon indians mm. and even after thousands of years they've noticed these soils are still more productive than, than the native soils and what they were using was their burn fire. So they had charcoal, pottery chards, and kind of had like a man-made enhanced soil. And, and so the biochar is stable. So we're trying it with synthetic fertilizer and um, organic fertilizer, poultry litter. And the idea is, will it increase nutrient retention, water holding capacity, leading to increased plant growth and yields? And in particular with poultry litter, there's food safety concerns. So using animal manures, there's a rule where where you um, have to apply at least 90 days before harvest for above ground um, portions of vegetables or 120 days before um, below ground portion of the vegetable. So you can't just side dress like you would with a synthetic fertilizer because of food safety concerns. And the issue there is you're concerned about putting all your nitrogen and everything even before you plant the crop that by the time it's fruiting, there's not enough left to support that crop. So that's why we're trying to pair it with biochar to see if we could, inc- you know, capture that nitrogen from leaching and be able to provide a longer, slower release. Well, what's the role of biochar? Is it bi- biologically active? Does it contain beneficial microorganisms in it or like what's what's its use? Is it does it help the soil become more porous where it's at and provide airspace? Like what you know, what is the reason for it? Yes. Um so it, it changes the physical characteristics, like I said, water holding capacity, nutrient capacity, and, and sand your soils, probably porosity and thicker more clay soils. It is an inert it's inert, but it just um changing the physical characteristics can lead to different microbial populations and and conditions for to cause ships okay but yeah sores just innovative stuff um you know there's G- gmo now there's stuff that's non-gmo it, gene editing you know so it gmo would be a foreign organism being put into a, a separate species where the the gene editing is they if that specific species has that gene in it they can and i don't understand it fully (laughs) but they could manipulate it so that gene is expressed and it's not considered gmo there's new plastic film mulches so um in vegetable crops for weed control will cover with plastic mulch and that increases water retention it it can manipulate the temperature of the soil. So we're using black plastics in early spring when it's cold to warm the soils. So we're using white plastics in the fall to uh, reduce um, soil temperatures. They've been, we've been using, that's the standard. We've been using that a long time. Um, now they have, this again, the standard is totally impermeable film. They used to have low-density polyethylene, high-density polyethylene, virtually impermeable film, now totally impermeable film. And with a totally impermeable film, we could reduce fumigants, which are gas applied under the um, plastic to to kill weeds and pests. We could reduce that um, 
only applying approximately 20 to 30 percent of the fumigants we were applying prior and getting similar control just with um yeah but wouldn't that create an anaerobic environment you know around the stem of the plant that's before planting now we punch holes and and it, where we plant into those holes yeah but still the localized soil around the uh you know would be more much more anaerobic than before so would that lead to different bacteria than before that are taking up residence and change the profile of the soil and you know the taste of the plants etc i would say um if you're over watering it definitely could probably get anaerobic easier and i don't know if you know and and it, that you know could do have microbial shifts and reduce root growth and things like that but i don't know about changing the taste or anything of of your fruits um i think what they're doing was um they're, they have paper mulch now. So, that, you know, that, and again, the idea of, so the problem with plastic mulch is disposal, right? It doesn't degrade. You have to pick it up, bring it to a land. Um, you know, you can recycle it because plastic is recyclable, but it's typically lower quality. You know, it's you, maybe park benches or something, but not like food containers. Um, so they're using paper mulch and... Again, that idea has been around for a long time of paper mulches and and um, mulches that um, that degrade and and they typically had issues. But there's a new one that's promising. That's all I'm getting at is you know in the past paper mulch like we tried it when I was in grad school and it was just like the brown rolls that you do for art projects and that stuff ripped and it got wet and fell apart you know and wasn't easy to work with. Um, they have plastic mulches that are degradable and you know what you want is something to last your whole season right so you you know just like mulch at your house it's the same thing it blocks sunlight from entering the soil preventing weed growth um conserving that moisture if it degrades before your crop's done then you got problems still so you want it to last the whole time so i think that's been a thing of yeah. a balance so i i've seen a, a new mulch that's um paper mulch and it's outperforming plastic mulch for nut sedge which is the biggest weed that we have in plastic culture because it it just pushes right through the plastic most you know seeds are inhibited by the mulch but the the plastic the t- nut sedge has tubers and can um and pointy leaf tips so it could forcefully puncture the mulch um and this paper you know I, again you know Research is full of surprises. If you had told me, I would have said, oh, I think it would probably do worse, right? Like paper in general is a, you know, weak material. So because of the chemical processing or what, what reason? I haven't worked with it, but um, Bob Hockluth out of Florida has worked with it, and there's some news articles about it. I believe it's um, it's paper, and it's got a lining from um, the cellulose of um, sugar cane. So it's got like a... A cellulose layer that I guess that's supposed to be the secret. I don't know. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, what what happens when sunlight shines on this uh, this plastic covering? You know, on the ground doesn't does it degrade it? I mean, what like what happens to it? You talking about the paper mulch or just our traditional uh, mulches that are the well both both the traditional is this plastic and then the paper. Yeah, the traditional it doesn't. We could reuse thing the mulch for up to three seasons. You could use it. As, at, at maximum spring fall and winter for example th- three seasons but and the new one i don't know about but yeah it, it's not a rapid de- degradation and for a lot of high value crops like strawberries you know they're they're just using plastic the plastic ones mm. in one crop and it holds up just fine okay well very good so what's the best way for people to uh to get help from you you know as an extension specialist or to uh, maybe ask questions or follow your work. Where can they go? Yes, sir. So my email is ted, T-E-D dot McAvoy, M-C-A-V-O-Y at U-G-A dot E-D-U. Um, you could always check out University of Georgia Horticulture, the faculty page. You could find me there. The University of Georgia Tifton campus faculty page. I don't know if I mentioned I'm at Tifton campus in Southern Georgia. I um, Okay. On my faculty page, there's links to my UGA Vegetables website and 
I run that website. So we, we post variety results. We have links to um, other faculty, other things that are have to do with agriculture. My lab website is South Georgia um, Vegetables. And that's so that it introduces you into the type of research I'm doing and introduce you to my team, uh, technicians, postdocs, everybody. And then also links to my Google Scholar page with that highlights the publication. Okay. Very good. Well, excellent. Let's have, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and I, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Richard. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.